Why, hello there, boys and girls. Welcome back to the Innovation Station. I'm so glad you're here with us. Now around here, we like taking old things and making them into new, just like God does by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to make us into something new by His Spirit. So we're going to get started around here today, but I was thinking about some of my favorite things to do this time of year. Do you boys like to go to the apple orchard, boys and girls, I mean, to go to the apple orchard and uh, pick apples? That's one of my favorite things to do. But I tell you what, it's not so easy getting up in those trees at my age. But thankfully, I've got my assistant Harold around here to help me out from time to time. As a matter of fact, Harold helped me pick this beautiful basket of apples off of one of our very own trees. You know, at the Innovation Station, we're always trying to find new stuff. And I had the idea to make a, a new kind of apple tree that's named the Caramel Apple Delight. And these apples happen to be from those very trees. In fact, I was just about to take the first bite, and I want you to come on over here and see how they look with me. Now, like I said, these are our very own invention. I wanted apples that taste just like a caramel apple, so over many different complicated processes, we turned these into a cross-pollination of a complicated procedure and blah, 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 and caramel apples, here we come. So here we go, the first bite of the caramel apple delight. Oh, 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 no, no, Harold, oh no. Yes, I was supposed you. to be, what's wrong? Oh, hmm, I was horrible. That tastes like a rotten apple, not like a caramel apple. I don't know what's wrong, but remember the caramel apple delight? Uh-huh. We just took the very first bite and it tastes horrible. Oh no, it didn't work, it's ruined. Or all our plans are gone. Oh, oh no. There, there, Dr. Hatch oh, here. Oh, no, Harold, what have I done? All of our time and effort, I could barely swallow it, okay? Oh, that was gross. Oh, oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh no, big problems. It's I don't okay. know what we're going to do. I, Dr. All of Hatch, our time. Oh, I'm sure you'll think. So I have another plan, you'll have a better idea next it's time. It's not going to work. We put all of our time into these trees and it takes forever to make a new apple tree. You know what I mean? Sure, but I have an idea. Yeah, what? Yeah, it's a brilliant new invention that I've been thinking about. No way. Yeah, well, you know how we like to take old things and make them new? But how is it going to fix the caramel apple delight? Well, you'll find out. And you know how I... it takes a really, really long time to grow a new apple tree. Um, yeah, I'm aware of that. That's well, the problem. I don't have time to grow new apple trees. I'm an old I man. have a brand new invention, which will take an old tree and will instantly transform it into a new apple tree right here into the in the lab no, 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 without no. you having the need to have to go out into the orchard and pick apples. No, Harold, this is I not call a good, this, this is, that doesn't even look safe. Apple Aimer no, no, 3.0. No, no. Oh dear. No, don't uh, Harold. All right, ready? One. Two, three. Uh, just need to make some adjustments. Harold, hold on. We need to talk about this before uh, you try shooting off guns. Just, hold on, just, here. I, I got it this time, I'm sure. All right, one, two, three. I, all right, well, apparently that needs some improvement, but I've got another idea. I, I think I can just... Uh, Harold, what are you doing? Uh, well, just gonna transform this tree. There, brand new apple tree with fresh apples on it, and you don't even have to go out into the orchard to pick it. And I'm sure they taste great. Here, try one. Well, I'll try it, but I know it tastes like a regular apple. What'd you expect, Harold? Wait, well, what'd problem. you think? No, here's the problem. One second, I gotta swallow this apple. You can't take new apples and put them on an old apple tree. Much less a tree that's not even real. That's a fake one. Oh. Harold, here's the problem. I didn't think If you think take about that. real apples and put them on an old tree, eventually they're just going to, you know, shrivel up and taste just as rotten and nasty as my caramel apple delights that also tasted rotten and nasty. Here's the problem. You can't just take anything and put it onto a different tree. If you try to put peaches on a pear tree or apples on a lemon tree, or I don't know, it's not going to work out right. You have to have trees that are of the same type. 
And if they're not real, of course, they're just going to shrivel up and, and die and fade away. It's not the best idea you've ever had, Harold. Oh, okay. But I can tell you, even though it's, it's been a failure and even though our caramel apple delight didn't even work out this time, there's still good news. Because you know what? Even though sometimes things do shrivel up and die because they're not on the right tree, if we're believers in God, we can have good fruit in our lives that grows because of the Holy Spirit working in us. What kind of what fruit? I mean? Well, the Bible calls it the fruit of the Spirit. Have you read of that before? Maybe. Well, actually, I talked to a special guest who's going to come tell us about the fruit of the Spirit, and I want you to listen closely to what she says. All right, Harold? All right. All right, let's listen to her. Good morning. Lately, we've been learning about the Holy Spirit. When we trust Jesus, we become children of God, and that changes us. It changes the way we think. We start to understand God better, and we realize what His will for our lives is. But that's not the only thing that changes. The way we live our life also changes. Today we're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, and you might wonder, what does that mean? The Spirit is who comes and lives in you after you have trusted Jesus with your life. Fruit is another word for what something produces. For example, a tree produces fruit. You know what kind of tree it is by if it has apples or oranges or bananas. Just like a tree has fruit, we have fruit too. Of course, ours isn't the kind you eat. It's what we do and how we live our lives. About five years ago, my daughter moved to Hawaii. Now, I'm not sure if you know where Hawaii is, but it's a long ways away. You go and fly across the Pacific Ocean for about five hours and you head down by the equator. Now, when we went to see her, we went on a lot of walks and it was real interesting because they have lots of different plants and trees and we didn't know what any of them were. The only way we knew what they were is by getting real close to them and examining them. We had to see what kind of fruit they grew in order to know what kind of tree it was. For example, we saw lemon and lime trees, avocado trees, grapefruit trees, mango trees, and even a star fruit tree. And that's just like us. Just like we had to examine that tree by what kind of fruit it had to see what kind of tree it was, people will also examine us and whatever fruit we have, what we produce and how we live our lives is how people will identify us. In the Bible, Paul addresses this. He wrote a letter to the church of Galatia talking about the Holy Spirit and what that does. I don't know if you remember who Paul is, but he is a Christian that lived after Jesus died and went to heaven. And he traveled all over to teach people about Jesus. This is the letter that he wrote to the Galatians. Listen to what he says about the Holy Spirit. So I tell you, live by following the Spirit. Then you will do what your sinful selves, you will not do what your sinful selves want. Our sinful selves want what is against our spirit and the Spirit wants what is against our sinful selves. The two are against each other. So you must not do just what you please. But if you let the Spirit lead you, you are not under the law. The result of sin's control in our lives is clear. It includes sexual immorality, impurity, and wild living, worshiping false gods, doing witchcraft, hating, making trouble, being jealous, being angry, being selfish, making people angry with each other, causing divisions among people, having envy, being drunk, having wild and wasteful parties, and doing other things like this. And Paul said, I warn you now, just like I warned you before, those who do these things will not be in God's kingdom, but the Holy Spirit gives love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law that says these things are wrong. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified their sinful selves. They have given up their old selfish feelings and the evil things they wanted to do. 
We get our new life from the Spirit, so we should follow the Spirit. We must not be proud. We must not make trouble with each other, and we must not be jealous. Wow. So the Bible says the Holy Spirit changes the way we act. When sin is in control, we do wrong things. We show hatred, anger, selfishness. We fight, we get in trouble, and people like this will not be in God's kingdom. But Jesus freed us from this. The Holy Spirit gives us the power to do what's right. When the Holy Spirit's in control, people choose love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These actions are the fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we forget that the Holy Spirit is there to help us and we try to do the right thing all alone. Have you ever tried really hard to do what's right and in about a day or two, you're already doing what's wrong again? To give you a picture of this, I'm gonna tell you a story. About three weeks ago, my son Michael moved into a new house. I went over to visit him and in his lawn he has a large apple tree and I wanted to go out and see the apple tree and pick apples so I could take them home and make an apple pie. When we went out and looked at the tree, all the apples were too high for us to reach and we didn't have an apple picker. But we looked on the ground and there were a lot of good apples that had fallen. They might have been a little bruised but most of them were really good. So we got a bag and we filled up the bag with these apples that had fallen to the ground. When I took them home, I didn't have time to make a pie, so I waited for a couple days and then I pulled out the bag. When I pulled out the bag and looked at the apples, this is what I found. This is what the apples looked like. They were brown and squishy and rotten. So I couldn't make this pie. Now why did they do that? Well, these apples looked good at first, and they did okay on the ground for a day or two, but after a while, they got rotten because they weren't connected to the tree. They weren't connected to the branches, and then the, they weren't connected to the root that brought in the water. This is what the apples were supposed to look like. These were the apples that were on the branch. They were perfect. And why did they look so much better? because they were connected to the branch, they were connected to the root, and they were able to be nourished. Now we can be just like that. We might, when we're connected to the tree, this is what we look like, but the tree is really God and the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes we try to do it all on our own. And when we're off the tree, when, we're, when we do it on our own, at first for a day or two, we might be okay. But eventually, when we're away from God and we're away from his spirit, this is what we become. The sin in our life does this to us. So it's really important to stay connected to the tree, connected to the root, which is God. You may think you can do it for a while on your own, but this is probably what's going to happen because of the sin in our lives. Just to remind you one more time, I have a picture to show you of the fruits of the spirit. Once again, they're love, goodness, self-control, being gentle, being kind and joyful, peaceful, and having faith. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to say no to sin and live in a way that pleases God. All right, well, thank you, Mrs. Bleasy. That's very important for us to understand what these fruits of the Spirit are. They're not real fruits like apples or oranges or pears. Instead, they're the ways that our lives show that the Holy Spirit is working in us. Now, Paul, he was writing in the book of Galatians, chapter 5, and I want us to try to learn these two verses, verses 22 and 23. And Paul was writing something that is true because it's in the Bible, and everything that God put in the Bible is true. It's his word for us. And it says here, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You see, when God's Holy Spirit works in us, then 
he's going to help to change us and he's going to put his life and what he wants us to do in to us so that when we work and we do actions that we'll be doing what he wants us to do but we need to remember that it's coming from him we can try to do many of these things ourselves but it's going to be very hard for us to do this see what is what are these things well love this is when you are giving of yourself to others what is joy this is when you know that god is working in your life and so you can give praise and glory to god even though things might be bad or things might be um, in you might be in a difficult situation you can still give glory to god and that's called joy peace this is when you can have calm and contentment even when the world is troubled long suffering well this means to be patient and also gentleness well, this is just being kind and nice to others. Goodness, this is being a good person and showing God's goodness through you. Faith, well, that's trusting in God. Meekness, well, that's kind of the opposite of being angry. It's letting others have first place, even if they do something that's wrong to you. And temperance, well, this is sort of like uh, temperance is self-control or where you're letting the Holy Spirit control you. For example, it's when you are going to, when you allow yourself to do the right thing at the right time. And also, it's when you, there might be something that you want to do at the wrong time, but you're not going to do it. For example, like you have a, when you're trying to eat some, where you're sitting down to eat, and you might have dessert over here, like some ice cream, and then you might have some vegetables. You're thinking, Ice cream or vegetables, ice cream or vegetables. Well, temperance says, first, I need to eat my vegetables, and then I can eat my ice cream. Sometimes it's putting aside what you want to do for what you need to do at that particular time. And then the verse says, against such there is no law. What this means is that God has given us many instructions in the Bible, and people, they make many laws and rules for how we should treat each other. But if we let God's Spirit work in us, then there's no law against any of these things. It won't be a crime to show love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, or temperance. These are all good things that God can work through us. But again, if you have believed on Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and these things, He wants to let them come out. But He can't unless you are trusting in Him for these good things. Some people, they try and do these good things by themselves, but it is very, very hard. It's almost impossible to do these good things without the Holy Spirit's help. But if you haven't believed on Jesus, you can try as hard as you want, but you don't even have the Holy Spirit's help because the Holy Spirit comes and lives in us when we trust in Jesus. And that is the only way we can get God's help in our lives. So to help us to learn this verse, what I'd like to do is put some actions to some of these words. So... When we say the word love, then we will put a heart like this. When we say joy, I want you to throw up your hands and give a jump for joy, okay? When we say peace, put your hand on your heart like you're quiet inside. When we say long suffering, we'll wipe our brow like we've been suffering very long. When we say gentleness, we'll just stroke our hand very gently. Goodness, we'll give a thumbs up. For faith, point to your head and to your heart knowing and believing what God has said. For meekness, that's when you show deference to others. We'll just say, like, oh, pass on by. And then temperance, this is like being self-controlled or very disciplined. A soldier knows how to follow orders, and being temperate means to know what is right and when to do it. So we're going to pretend like we're a soldier, and we're going to salute for temperance. And we'll say, against such there is no law. This is Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Let's try and put all those actions together. Are you ready? Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Did you get them all? Okay, let's go again, and we'll see if we can go just a little bit faster. Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. 
but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Are you beginning to get them? This is a long verse, so learning those actions will really help you to learn it. Let's see if we can go one more time, and this time we'll go as fast as I can. Are you ready? Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. Well, this are all, all of these things. We call them fruits, but they're just the things that God produces in our lives. And it helps us to change. And we've been asking the question, who changes us? Well, the Holy Spirit changes us to be like Jesus for God's glory. So these things that the Holy Spirit can do in our lives can help us to change us to look more like Jesus. And we've also been learning a verse about that change. And how whenever we choose to trust in Jesus, God makes us into someone new. This is 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. And we've also been learning a song that will help us to learn this verse. So let's sing that together. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Great. Now, what we'd like to do now is we're going to turn it over to Dr. Hatch, and he is going to tell us a new story this week. All right, boys and girls. Well, it's time for a new story. We've been talking about John Payton, who is a missionary, but now we're going to talk about a man who invested his life in caring for young and homeless children. Now, the story we're going to talk about is about the life of a man named George Mueller. Now listen carefully and we'll get started with his story. George heard the slam of the carriage door outside. It was his father who stomped inside the front door and spied George on the stairs. So, you aren't even ashamed enough to hide. I would think you'd have learned some manners after spending a month in prison. George glared back at his father. I learned that meals in German jails are terrible and I learned how much you care about me. You could have paid my fine a lot quicker, Father. It wasn't George's first encounter with the law. This time, he had tried to leave a village inn or a hotel without paying his bill. His father's anger turned to grief for a moment. You're only 18 and already a common thief, George. If your mother were still alive, I'm glad she doesn't have to see what you've become. And what about you, Father? George shot back. You're nothing but a tax collector living off the government's money. It was too much for his father. In a flash, he grabbed a cane hanging on the wall. I'll teach you some respect. The cane cut sharply through the air. Any feelings of guilt George might have had were quickly forgotten as he returned to his old habits. He had given in to his father's wishes for him to become a minister for the German state, and he was now studying at the university in Hall, Germany. However, most evenings he could be found avoiding his studies and relaxing in the village tavern surrounded by friends. One such evening he was seated at a table telling a story when he noticed a stranger at the end, a stranger who looked familiar. One of his companions spoke up. Beta, come here and meet George Mueller. He'll teach you how to really drink. I know George Mueller already, the stranger replied with a smile. George's mind raced. Where had he met him before? It must have been from school somewhere. Then he remembered. 
Here was Beta, the boy who never sinned. He always had his Bible and hymn book with him, never cheated on tests or exams, and never even drank alcohol. Now he was seated with a mug at the table listening to George. Continue with your story, George, Beta said eagerly. Later that evening, Beta caught up with George underneath a street lamp. George, I bet you never thought you'd see me here. I guess uh, a little, George replied. George was more than a little surprised. As a schoolboy, Beta had never missed an opportunity to tell George he was very bad. Beta continued, I'm different now, George. I just want to have a little fun like you. George laughed. Beta, if you only knew, I always wished I was a little more of a saint like you were. In fact, George was sick and tired of all the silliness, but he didn't know how to get away from it. I guess we'll let fate decide, he said at last. Will you go my way or will I go yours? Beta and George soon became good friends, but they both seemed to be going George's way and getting into a lot of trouble. Over the summer, along with three other friends, they hiked to Switzerland. It looks very beautiful there, doesn't it? Each had a passport signed by his parents, or so it seemed. George had carefully forged his father's signature. Although each had money for the trip, they placed their leather pouches together in one large pouch. George was the natural choice to hold the pouch as he was the best with money and math. Little did the others know that he was also best at looking out for himself. While the others snoozed on beautiful grassy hillsides, George would carefully transfer some coins from each of his friend's pouches into his own. One time, Beta caught George in the act. What are you doing, George? Nothing. George froze for a moment, but quickly regained his composure. Just uh, organizing a, a little bit. You're a good fellow, George, Beta said with a yawn, always keeping track of things. Someday your talent for money may even come in handy. Beta rolled over and went back to sleep. George smiled. After the Switzerland trip, things continued unchanged until one night outside the tavern, George and Beta stood again below the lamplight. See you tomorrow, Beto? See you tomorrow, Beta? George asked. Beta hesitated. What's wrong, George? Asked. I, I promised a friend named Wagner I would meet him tomorrow. Fine, bring him along. We'll have a good time together. Beta's eyes began to bulge as if they were going to burst. Look here, George. When I told you I wanted to have fun, I, I didn't mean I wanted to turn my back on being good forever. Go on, Beta. George said. Wagner's having a prayer meeting. A prayer meeting? Sounds like an interesting fellow, George jested. George felt humiliated, felt like humiliating Beta, but something made him say, I'd like to meet him. Tomorrow, in fact. Maybe I'll even learn something from your goodness after all, Beta. Wagner's house was tucked into a long row of gray stone houses within the village. George noted that it had a friendly look. At the door, he was greeted with a handshake from Wagner. We welcome you as a brother, Herr Mueller. Find a seat and a hymn book. We're about to begin. Several men sat in a circle. Unlike most religious men he had met, these men seemed rather ordinary and humble. Wagner introduced him to the others and then asked one man to pray. What happened next shocked George. The man stood up and turned his back to the circle. Facing his chair, he knelt down on the hard wooden floor. George, George had never seen a man pray like this, not even in the state church. The man began to pray, but again, not as George was used to hearing. This man spoke to God as if he were right in the room and so close that this man had to kneel in his humility, almost like someone would do before standing before a king. This man feared God and adored him. George began to think about himself. What did he know of God? He had studied the Bible and he could probably speak more eloquently about it than most of the men in the room. But did he know God? Well, his life certainly didn't show it. George Mueller said whatever he wanted to say. He thought whatever he wanted to think and did whatever he wanted to do. George Mueller was the king of his own life. 
Suddenly, he began to feel sick. Nothing in his life had brought joy and peace like the kind he saw in the man that was speaking to God. Later that evening, George quietly made his way back to his room. Its bare walls reminded him of the emptiness in his own heart. He had gone to the prayer meeting that night expecting to sing a few hymns and to find some material to make a fool of Beta, but instead something was happening to him. For years he had understood perfectly that Jesus Christ had died on the cross to save sinners, but this truth had never lived in his heart. Now he understood. Jesus Christ had died for him, for self-serving George Mueller. And Jesus had done it so George could know God in the same way as the man at the prayer meeting. Beside his bed, George dropped to his knees. With his hands spread over his bed, he prayed. His prayer was not a rehearsed or planned one like he was used to, but one that was made to ask forgiveness of Almighty God. With a sigh, George finished, At last, God, tonight I am yours. In the following weeks, the direction of George's whole life changed. Rather than becoming a minister of the German state, George decided to become a missionary. It wasn't a decision easily made. George wondered what his father would think. In the spring, George met a man named Herman Ball. Ball was a missionary to the Jewish people in Poland. His clothes were cheap, but George could tell by the way he acted that Ball was from a wealthy family. Eventually, Ball told what had happened. His father was a wealthy merchant from East Germany. However, when he found out that his son had decided to give up a career instead to serve Christ, Ball had been kicked out of the family. Would the same thing happen to George? Well, I want to continue with this story and I'm excited to hear what happened to George Mueller, but we're going to save the rest of the story for another time. So until then, keep thinking about that and we're going to go over to Harold and we're going to see what plans he has for us this week. Well, I hope you all have been working really hard with us here at the Innovation Station. And so you hopefully have gotten a new packet this week, which gives you even more things that you can do to help show just how much you love God's word and just that God has changed you if you've trusted in Christ. So we have some uh, instructions here about how you can earn some points and the different ranks that you have. But most importantly is your inventory assessment. You have five items that you can do to get points. One of them is watching this video, which I think you're doing right now. So that is going to give you 200 points. And we also give you a coloring sheet and an activity page. If you do those, that's going to be 50 points. And if you're younger than seven years old, we're gonna give you 100 points for doing the activity sheet. And also our verse, it's a really long one this week. So we're going to give you 200 points if you can learn that verse. So just remember to get those actions in, practice it over and over, and I'm sure you'll get it fine. If you can't, don't worry. We're gonna give you a shorter verse that you can say for 25 points too. Also, then, when someone checks in with you from Straight Gate Church, they're going to ask you some questions about what you learned. And if you talk with them and have a good discussion, then you'll get 200 more points. And the big points are for studying your Bible every day. And we give you a little bookmark to help you with that. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you just do a little bit of Bible study. You just look up the verse, read what it says, fill in the blank, and ask God to teach you something from it so that you can be changed by God's Bible. And I think many of you have been working hard. So I'm just going to hop over and we're going to look at the leaderboard this week to see how many points people have earned. All right. Now, before I get to our points, I just want to say I'm so glad for those of you who are watching us, who are opening your packets, who are doing your work, even if it's just a little bit. I'm so happy that you're doing that. Now, a girl named Khalidra gave this to me. Here at the Innovation Station, we like to take old things and make them new or find new ways to use them. And she took something, a plain coloring page, and she added some color and made it into something new and beautiful. And if you have something that you have colored very nicely or some invention you've made, some ways you've taken an old thing and found something new and you want to show that to us, well, just uh, get in contact with us or with your mentor who checks in with you at Straight Gate Church. And maybe I can show that thing that you've made 
here on the Innovation Station. Well, let's look at our points now, shall we? So these are the students who have been with us for the first two weeks of the Innovation Station. They've been working hard and they've been getting points. So we have two people who have made it to Scientist. It is Kenneth and Barrett. And we also have several lab assistants. Congratulations, Malaysia and Kamara Lee, Micah, Jonah, Sam, Princess, Michelle, Josiah, and Isaac. Good job, guys. And then we have some who are just joining us as apprentices. That's Mary, Tyler, Daniel, Kelly, Kalidra, Beyonce, Celeste, Josue, and Anya. Well, to all of you, I'm glad that you're working hard. And before we go, we need to sing our straight gate song. So, Dr. Hatch, can you come and help me out with this? Oh, I'd love to, Harold. Let's sing this song together, okay? All right. <laughs> Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life eternal. No room for pride, no room for works, or trust in the external. You can enter the gate, you can find the way, but all the saints have trod. Jesus is the gate, Jesus is the way that leads direct to God. But pride is the gate, and Broad is the way that leads to hell's destruction. You can go as you please, live a life of ease, ignore the Bible's instructions. But the friends you choose and the pleasures that amuse will win you a delay. Oh no! Wide is Satan's gate, broad is Satan's way that leads to hell someday. saints have trod. Jesus is the gate. Jesus is the way that leads direct to God. Excellent okay. singing, boys and girls. We're going to miss you, but until next time, I'm Dr. Hatch. And I'm Harold. And we hope you stick around to watch the main Sunday service right here at Straight Gate this morning at 11 o'clock. So stick around and enjoy it with us. All right, goodbye. Bye, everybody.